But they live Just in this. Just think of him barking like a sea lion. Hey, maniacs. Hey, maniacs. It's Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to British TV mystery. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhems, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week we are covering... The show this week that we're digging into is Jonathan Creek. Episode one. Season season one. one. The pilot. The pilot. It's a two-part pilot. The wrestler's tomb. I love that. They never explain it. (laughs) <laughs> Never explain. There's no wrestlers. There's no tomb. No. Nope. Nothing. No. Nope. No. Nope. But it's such an enigmatic name for such an awesome house. Nobody. I dig nope. It. Nope. I dig it. These aren't based on books. It's the second thing that we've ever done that's not based on books. The only other thing we've done that's not based on books is Shakespeare and Hathaway. Ah, true. Yeah. One episode of that. Speaking of which, uh, thanks, yes, we had June Tindall on, uh, and you guys seemed to love her. Interview. She was super fun. She was super fun, and she uh, laid out some uh, scoop for us. If you didn't pick it up, there's a couple of things. One, we were put in touch with her via a production person on the Sister, show, Sister Boniface. Yeah, we if you're ass- listening, Sister Boniface. <laughs> we assumed that. Lisa had passed a note to her. Yep. To say that we would like to interview her. And that was on a, those were on show. We haven't even covered Sister Boniface yet. Mm. That was on shows that we were covering of Father Brown. Right. So they're craziness. I can't yeah. believe it. If you're listening, whoever you are, a production yes. person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Jude, Jude, I would not be at all surprised if Jude makes a reappearance on our show at some later. That'd date. be awesome if she was willing. Later, date. she was really, really fun. Yep. But this week, oh, and we're gonna send her some swag. Yeah, including so, um, Sister Boniface, Boniface conspiracy T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we won't get a takedown notice if we send her one. <laughs> hey, you know that character you created that we just put on a shirt? We don't own it, but we're selling shirts. Isn't it? For charity. Funny. Uh, yes. Now you have one, so you're in on it. So I guess you can't tell us not to. <laughs> is that is that how it works? <laughs> uh, yes. And if you don't know, the merch that we do sell on our website is all the money all goes to charity. Actually, double the money goes to yeah, charity. Yeah, we, we match it out of our we, very own we match hard-earned it pockets. Out of our own hard-earned pockets. Because it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, also, uh, a number of people asked for pictures of Olive. I guess she's <laughs> quite the star now. <laughs> I can tell you one thing. She doesn't like snow. Oh, boy. We got snow today that won't stick around. No. Nope. But whew, she's disgusted by it. She just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you follow my personal account, there's a video of her in the snow, and it's she's not happy. But I'll post that to all the. Oh, is that the social. bullshit video? Yeah, but, <laughs> it's bullshit. She, she definitely. But I have, I do have something for you, Sarah. Mm-hmm. I've solved a mystery. Oh, what? I know where Sergeant Scott has ended up. Oh, so do I. Oh, okay. Where he, did he... he disappeared from Midsummer, yes. right? Oh, he had a cold and then he just never came back and they replaced him, which is a bad thing to do. I which is really it. weird because I had a sick day on Friday because I wasn't feeling good. So, Oh, you don't know about what happened? Maybe you say I got replaced at work. Maybe. <laughs> I, say, I think that's against HR rules. No, he's reappeared. The actor has reappeared. Not John that he was, Hopkins. He wasn't really missing. He's been no. doing all kinds of fabulous yes. stuff since. But he's reappeared in a very interesting place, and that is that he is narrating the Carolyn Graham Inspector Barnaby books on Audible. Yes. And yes. I, I'm guessing other places they're not Audible originals. But no. they've got the first three books out now. And the second and the fourth one comes out on the first of December. Yeah. So, so that's I, super cool. I, I haven't listened to them. I listened to I, the first one and he does a great job. It's really fun. I was gonna save those for my next trip to Canada. Yeah, to but it's kind of it. like, yep. Scott, you weren't there. How do you know about that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> How did you know? He does a great job. They're really fun. So if you uh, like audiobooks, check one out because you get it from your library or whatever. 
Uh, I'm an audible junkie. So another question that we got this week uh, via a social network was, are you guys leaving Twitter? Mm, We don't know. Twitter is in a state of flux right now, to Mm -hmm. say the least. Mm -hmm. I will not pay eight bucks for a check mark to validate either of our accounts. No. I will not shut down our accounts because that also allows our names to be used. Right. Somebody else can claim our username, yeah. To be used. But we may be expanding our number of networks. We'll see. We'll see. We're kind of in a wait and see. Just wait and see. We want to be wherever you are. Yeah. Which is predominantly YouTube and Facebook. Yeah. That is predominantly where we are. By the way, we have 65 followers to get to 1,000. On YouTube? 65. (laughs) Please, just ask your mom, your sister, whatever. Get your kid to click the button. Come on. There are 65 people on it. You must have 65 children or grandchildren somewhere. Somebody has 65 children or grandchildren. Just send it out in the family newsletter once a month. (laughs) Bribe them. Say you'll get better presents for Christmas if you click the button. So, so the the other th- another couple of things I learned when we when we hit that thousand, we'll be able to put our Shopify shop right on the page. Yeah. Right. So you'll be able to get you merch care about that, easier. but other people probably yeah. Don't, you'll you know, be able to get merch easier. Mm-hmm. And then second of all, the algorithm of course notices you far more often. Our our reach will increase, but we'll also get a little community space there yep, too, right? We'll get a little community space, and that yeah. would be fun. Yeah, that'd be nice. Are you ready to dive into Jonathan Greek? I do, but first, you keep saying that. Can we talk about it or what? Yes, we're going to talk about but, Jonathan Greek, but first, we need to know where it is on the gorometer. The gorometer. Did, were you calling it the gorometer? Yes, that's so awkward. Okay, it's gorometer. a gorometer. So the grometer, if you weren't there for our live episode. Mm-hmm. It's the scale that uh, we, we, we're going to use from now on to rate the violence, bloodiness, bloodiness, gore. Violence, yeah. Of a c- cozy show, the yep. ones that we like. Grometer. It yep. goes from boy, oops. Uh, oops to we're going to need more bleach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it goes from uh, a rolling pin all the way to a wood chipper. Yep. Um, and I would put at least this episode of Jonathan Creek in the poison category. I would put it past rolling pin. It's not, well, I just, I hit him and I, but I, I didn't mean to kill him. Yeah. Right. It's not, well, I pushed him down the stairs to make it look like he fell. Yeah. Poison is next. I would say that's premeditated. Yes. But not overly gory or close up. Yes. It's not quite dagger. Dagger is confrontational, stab you in the guts with a little we knife. We see more blood in this episode in the magic tricks than we do in the actual in the murder. murder. Yeah. So I would put it in the poison category. Yeah. And I would agree. We'll evaluate each episode as we go. But yes. that's where I would put it. Uh, you can also get the garometer on t shirts. Stickers, tote bags, coffee mugs, whatever, whatever Aprons. you want. If there's yep. something you At want that's not on, you yep. can get it. Um, but yeah, that's the garometer. We probably need some uh, some music for the garometer or sound effect or something. I'll come up <laughs> like with a, a bumper. Like a, like it's firing up. Oh, yeah. Goes, well, bing, 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 yeah, poison. We, we, oh, okay. That's what we'll do. I'll do that. <laughs> we I'll just came up, up with it right I'll now. I'll come up with the garometer sound. <laughs> All right, so Jonathan Creek, if you've never watched it, if this is your first taste of Jonathan Creek, know that this is a pilot. Yeah. This first episode. So So they're trying to sell this series. And what what we mean by pilot is this is the way television's made, if you don't know. They make pilots, which is one show. One episode that convinces the network to then invest in the rest of the season. Yes. Right? And this is, for a pilot... It's pretty good. A lot of shows, they make a pilot and then they end up remaking that first episode as part of the actual season because the pilot has a very low budget or it doesn't have the right actors or whatever. And but, this is why you see sometimes a big discrepancy in either characters, actors, or time Yeah, between the first episode and the second episode, yeah. and which there, we saw in Poirot and Midsummer. Yeah. And there are certainly some things in this episode that they work out later and improve upon and we'll we'll kind of talk about those as we go through. Some of them are kind of fun, some of them are kind of annoying. 
But if if you watched this episode and this was your first taste of Jonathan Creek and you were like, ah, I don't know. Uh, what you might not be so sure about, probably going to get fixed by episode yep. two. <laughs> this <laughs> this is a series that definitely improves as it goes along. Definitely. Definitely. So it was originally broadcast on the 10th of May, 1997. Man, back in the age of double denim. Does wow. everybody wear double denim in 97? This is, I the, don't remember that. This is the 90s, 90s show we've ever Ooh, shown. That logo, that Jonathan Creek logo. There's not enough flip phones. It's extreme. <laughs> <laughs> it's metal and spiky. Yep. But they do a good theme song. They do. So uh, directed by Marcus Mortimer and written by David Renwick, who went on to fame and fortune writing for. Ah, oh, he's written all kinds of things. No, but you said he, uh, the American show that he wrote for. Oh, he wrote for Cosby. Cosby, that's right. But yeah. that was kind of before, that was before during, that. after that's, this. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it was a good show. It's a good in show. It's time. Yep. But then we learn more. And, uh, anyway. Um, he's written a lot of stuff, but he is purely responsible for Jonathan Creek. They're not based on books. He came up with the idea. Yep. And had a good enough relationship with the actors that even though when they were done filming, Alan Davies said he wasn't interested in doing another series like this because of the workload. Yeah. But he would come back out of loyalty to Renwick. And so the characters that are the central characters for the first season are Jonathan Creek. Mm-hmm who is played by Alan Davies mm -hmm. and his coat. Yes, his toggle coat. Gorgeous coat. And right? Madeline McGellan, yes. who's played by Carolyn Quinton. Yes. And they stay. Yep. And everybody else changes. Through the first few seasons anyway. Yeah. Yeah. The whole idea is that, you know, he designs illusions for a magician. And because he has that kind of brain, he can help solve mysteries. All of the cases are sort of locked room type of mysteries. They're impossible crimes yep. or... They look like they're not crimes at all, but they are, and the way they've been pu pulled off is seemingly impossible. And She's the nosy, pokey journalist, and he is the illusionist, so together they can figure it out. But he's not the performer. No. He, he builds the illusions. He designs them. He's the illusion engineer, I learned they're called. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. It's serious, Sorry. Mark. It's serious? It's serious. It's serious. Yes. I do think that this may be the most frightening opening shot that we've ever seen in any of the shows that we've the naked clown lady yes <laughs> she's huge <laughs> i can say one thing for headley's art he varies in scale a lot he does because some of them are like kind of like 10 by 10 you know a little quaint little wall painting and but the the one that he's walking in front of with the interviewer is like 20 feet tall yeah. <laughs> She's like the naked clown lady who ate New York. Like, uh, she's an entire know, wall. I want to know who these naked clown ladies got painted by. You know, they're really good because the one that is topless, not, well, her name's topless. Yeah. <laughs> but she's topless in the painting. Yeah. <laughs> I just got that. Yes. <laughs> Um. <laughs> oh, I'm a dork. You're just kidding. <laughs> it's a Greek name. It's L-I-S. Topolis. Yeah. Anyway, the one that... Also, there's a character in a Bond movie called Pussy Galore. Oh, I never got that one. Does she like cats? <laughs> anyway... The paintings that are supposed to be Katrina yeah. look like Katrina in clown makeup. And the one that is supposed to be Francesca looks like Francesca in clown makeup. They absolutely do. And uh, they are playful in, a, in an interesting way. I think they're interesting paintings. Seductio ad absurdum. Now, I don't want one. No. But I can understand why for one series of paintings, it would be an interesting, you know, um, topic. But I can't imagine building a career around them. Yes. You know, like Headley's going to have to move on to something else. He's not. And like. I could see him having, I almost don't know why the art is in this episode other than the, the whole muse thing, because usually when an artist dies in an episode, it's all about who gets the paintings and the money. I think that's what makes this interesting yeah. is that it's not about the value of the art. Yeah. Because she ruins the, her own painting. Mm -hmm. She has a painting of a dead artist who is big enough to do a gallery show. With you say a, who? 
It's Francesca. Yeah, Francesca. Remember, this is a spoiler podcast. Yep. We are going to ruin it for you. If you have not watched The Wrestler's Tomb, season one, episode one of Jonathan Creek, we're about to ruin it. Stop right now. And it might be episode one and two for you. Right. Francesca's the killer. Okay. Th- that leads me to th- something that I did want to talk about, which is this is the worst kind of show for me. Why? Because I always remember the puzzles and never remember the Who solution. Did it? <laughs> so almost all the Jonathan Creek episodes, I can say, oh, it's that. It's, it's that. the one it's where that. they die in the room with, that has no doors or windows. That, okay. The one in the tower where they disappear, we won't name the episode. That I remember because I think I've watched it five times because I keep forgetting what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, so let's do this a bit more in order here. We're going to make people crazy. Yeah. So we've got Headley and Serena Shale. He's an artist. Yep. She's an editor in chief at a ladies' magazine Eve called Eve Magazine. Eve, which does not look like a fun magazine. No, I don't know what it's supposed it. to be. They they have a house cleaner called Katrina Topless, and then he has a a model Francesca Boutron. And they're all at the gallery show except for Topless. Right. And Headley and Serena are not exactly close anymore. No. That it's no. antagonistic. Uh, she talks to him in a very antagonistical way and he returns it. And then she leaves and he calls somebody to make him bark like a sea lion. <laughs> <laughs> but they live Just in this. Just think of him barking like a sea lion. Well, I can't because that's Colin Baker. He's Doctor Who, for God's sakes. You know, he's the only person to ever play Doctor Who who got fired. Oh, I didn't know he got fired. Well, he got fired because the ratings were so bad that they stopped filming. Oh, okay. So they had to let him go. Not okay. because he was bad. But yeah, he he's, uh, he's a Doctor Who. Yeah, he is. I'm sure people are going, why haven't you mentioned that Colin Baker is Doctor Who? There you go. Because he's in the episode for five minutes. And then he's uh, laying on the ground. And he gets best corpse because he's the only one. And half one. of it, he's like... Thumb in a butt. That's like <laughs> what he does. This is an audio medium. When you make that motion with your hand, I know what you're talking about, but everybody on the other end just hears you say thumb in a butt. When He's she using his to thumb him. to shape the, the paint on the line of a woman's butt cheek on yep. a painting. Yep. Thumb in a butt. <laughs> Which might be the name of the episode. <laughs> You can't thumb a butt on an audio medium. Is that what it is? Serena, his wife, the editor, is played by Sheila Gish. Yeah. And if you are a nerd, you might recognize her from Highlander. She was in Highlander. What part was she in Highlander? Uh, It's hard to describe. A lady, a woman in Highlander. (laughs) She's very glamorous. She's a beautiful woman. And she... um, well, now I have to watch Highlander again yeah. today. Shortly before she died, she um, had a big tumor removed from her face that made her lose an eye. Oh. So she wore an eye patch for the last few years of her life. And even in the eye patch, she looks glamorous. I can see that. She's just so beautiful. Absolutely. And so good at being a snobby bitch. She manages to do that exceptionally well. But, you know, when she's walking through the office to go to to go to work, she's clearly large and in charge but she says good morning to people yeah, she's she's not me and her and her pa are pretty they seem okay with each yeah. other i mean they're not like what'd you do over the weekend honey she says good weekend like she actually yep. pretends to care anyway if she doesn't really also you know this is 1997 because she smokes indoors in her office yeah <laughs> makes a point of it <laughs> I love, so okay so the whole premise here is that she goes into her office, says she does not want to be disturbed, closes the door, locks it, basically. Meanwhile, Headley has somebody coming over. Headley <laughs> calls somebody over to make him scream like a sea lion or whatever, gets killed. But she's been in her office, so she has an alibi, right? Yeah. But the PA, Joy is her name. She was in uh, Two Midsummers, by the way. Yeah. Her name's Rebecca Charles. She was in Hidden Depths and Strangler's Wood. Meanwhile, she gets a call from Davina Yates. Yes. A model who wants her photos back. Who's too short and too fat. You got to give Renwick credit for the little things of humor he does. Okay. He's so good at these, like, it's not an overtly funny show. Yeah. But when he's funny, he's funny. There's some jokes in this. She 
Joy looks at the photos in the portfolio, and clearly this woman is not up to model standards based on her photos, which we don't see. Yeah. But when she gets back on the phone, she says, hello, Danny, I mean, DeVito, I mean, Davina. <laughs> so we're left thinking she looks like Danny DeVito, yes. <laughs> which is not supermodel no. material, by the way. No. <laughs> no matter what your standard of beauty is. Meanwhile, at Wrestler's Tomb, we have killer vision, but the black gloves that push away the, the trees... Mm -hmm. Are no woman in this episode. You don't think so? No. I, I was watching pretty closely this time and thought, oh, those are nice leather gloves. They fit They're nice well. leather gloves, but I don't think they're woman's hands. Mm, okay. I find it interesting that they're so concerned about security that they don't even have a back gate to their walled garden. So they must have to take their lawnmower through the house. <laughs> but they have an external staircase. Suddenly, there are two people who appear out of nowhere and then we're put then we're given contact, but we're not introduced to them at all. When the maid talks to the guy fixing his car, mm -hmm. like at first you're like, "Who are these? Wait, what? Who are these people?" Well, Katrina talks to the mechanic just to establish her alibi. Yeah. I mean, that's in, in the writer's sense anyway. Yeah. We have to know that somebody saw her going there at a certain time. And he's a fellow witness. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, Francesca couldn't have got that better if she'd planned that herself. Yeah. But <sighs> Katrina, before she even finds the body, is the worst housekeeper in the universe. Okay. Because she comes in the house with those muddy, muddy shoes. Any okay. housekeeper would be like, I have to clean my shoes before I go in. Because she's just going to make a mess that she has to clean up. Yeah. Did that bother you? Yes. <laughs> You're like rubbing your eyes. <laughs> it just reminded me of the napkin scene, which... Oh! Uh, uh. She blows her nose on a Picasso. <laughs> you know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. It just doesn't need to happen. It's this whole idea that... Jonathan is so socially awkward that he's just prone to mishaps, you know, yeah. even when he's trying his best, yeah. uh, that things just don't go right for him. <laughs> we hear the gunshot. She runs upstairs. The artist is dead and the girlfriend's tied up. And suddenly mechanic man is there behind her. Well, I would assume that he heard the shots. I would assume that he heard the shots. Let's talk about this grocery store scene. Okay. Because this is really when we meet Jonathan. Yes. Right? So that, it's a long, cold open. Mm-hmm. Maddie's not in it for the first 20 minutes. Yeah. And she's the second most important character in the show. Yes. So Jonathan's at the store. First of all, it's weird to me that cashiers sit down. I, I think it's a British thing. I don't have any problem with it. They yeah. should be able to sit down. They should. But cashiers in the U.S. don't sit down. No. Do they sit down at Aldi's? I think they might. I think they might at Aldi's. But they might have to bring their own chair. Maybe. <laughs> or an Aldi's chair. Because you have to bring your own bags there. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Aldi's humor. <laughs> We're at the height today. <laughs> It just seems weird that the cashier's sitting down. But this is how we learn that Jonathan is so smart. Yes. He's almost a savant, right? Yeah. Because he's keeping track of the total of the tab of the woman in front of him at the grocery store and figures out that it's, what, 30 cents off, something like something that? Like I that. mean, it's less than half a pound off. And his intelligence creates awkward social situations. That's what you we're think? supposed to get. Yeah, because he can't not say something. Yes. And then it inconveniences everybody. Yes. But I blame the woman whose shopping it is, too, because she says, well, we should just check to be sure. She yes. doesn't say, oh, well, if it's 30 cents no, no, off, I don't no, care. No, no. She She's, says. She wants to know. Yeah. And then the manager's like, oh, everybody's got to move now. John, everybody looks. Because this computer is wrong. Yeah. What? No. The manager is uh, important to me, maybe not important to you, because the supermarket manager is Jonathan Marquez. And as soon as I saw him, I'm like, I know that guy. He's in, he's uh, the uh, he's the policeman in Doc Martin, oh, which that's you right. haven't watched a lot of, but yeah. I've watched almost all of. I was like, where do I know him? Where do I know him? No, that's and, right. He's the cop in yeah, Doc Martin. He is the only, I think, I think he's the only cop in Doc Martin. And then suddenly we're in the countryside. Where does Jonathan Creek live in relationship to a grocery store? To a grocery store, to London, to Victoria Station. So he lives, he definitely lives outside London because he stays in a hotel when they have a show. Yes. He does not go home. No. But I don't think he drives. No. 
I don't think he ever drives. So he must take the train from London out to where he lives. I assume the grocery store is near to where he lives, and he either takes the bus to his place or walks. And I never noticed this before, but he says the windmill has been in his family for five generations. Yes. So it's not just his weirdness that he lives in a windmill. No. He comes from a long line of weird people that yes. live in windmills. Though I love that windmill. The windmill is fantastic. It's amazing. It's it's kind of one of the signature things of the of the series. And of course, he's buying a Barbie, yes. which is weird. Now, and then he's sawing the head, the head off, off the Barbie. Cutting the head <laughs> off. It's the, the kind of thing I would do. <laughs> I'm just buying these so I can decapitate them. Yep. For a project. Uh, so the cops find jewelry in a little bag yep. in the yard. So the idea is that, oh, it's, it was a break-in and the thief ran away and dropped the jewels in the yard. So this poor, I love how Stephen Grismel gets arrested. Yes, it's, he's at the theater. It's epic. Yep. And the police who come in, um, D.S. Davey, who was in four weddings and a four funerals and a wedding the yes. midsummer. He has pre-prepared signs. He does. <laughs> the first one asks who it is. Yeah. And Are you Stephen Grismel? You're yeah. nicked. You're nicked. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. Oh. Well, where's he going to go? Apparently, there's only one way in the aisles at that movie and theater. And they kind of trample over a couple of people. Why didn't they just wait till the movie was I over and grab I him as he came I out? I don't it know. It wouldn't be nearly as funny. I don't know. But they, they arrest him. But I just, I love that D.S. Davey pre-prepares the signs. <laughs> <laughs> also, I love that Adam's henchmen have names. Yes. Her Rhino and... Herbie. Herbie, his bouncers. Poor so, Adam. So, so Poor Adam Jonathan. Klaus is the magician that... Uh, that Jonathan works for. Yes, played he, by Anthony Head. He is American. Yes, he's in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He is. He does a really good job in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I know. He's in a number of other things. You but. guys have to know, there's a long going, not quite feud about Buffy between the two of us. But when we met, you made it very clear to me that you really liked Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I still do. And I had only ever seen a little bit of it and did not like it. Yes. At all. Nope. And you said, you can say you don't like it, but only after you watch a whole season. You have to watch at least a season before you say you don't like it. Yes. So I watched a whole season. The first Buffy. season, all six episodes. Yes. And still don't like it. Yeah. But you do. And that's great. Yeah. And so Anthony Head does not continue to play this character in Jonathan Creek. This is the no, only he, episode he's, he's in because episode. he goes to be in Buffy the Vampire Slayer instead. Yes, and he is replaced by... An actor whose name I don't remember right now. Stuart Milliken. Gosh, if that's right, I'm impressed with myself. Good on me! Yeah. For the record, Mark just looked it up. <laughs> and edited out the big long silence where he was looking it up. And I was right. Yep. And uh, he's Canadian, I think. Yes, he is. So he, he plays uh, Adam Klaus for the next couple of seasons. And he's been in Midsummer before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about him later. But yeah, so Jonathan builds and engineers the illusions for Adam Klaus, who is the stage magician with his little fake ponytail that he clips on every night, apparently, in his leather pants. And What, uh, what is amazing is the Adam Klaus from the regular season series mm -hmm. is more sleazy and more likable than Anthony had here. Yeah, yeah, it's, he it's is. It's amazing how much more sleazy he is. He is like five <laughs> notches more sleazy. <laughs> and yet he is more likable than Anthony had here. Yeah. I, I still come back to the glue thing. I don't want, I want to have a warm bath with her in, in glue. Glue? It just. What does that mean? It sounds gross. Oh. Uh, so you know, get all over you. Uh, yeah, you know Anthony Head from Buffy. But, <laughs> when, but when I first saw him in this, where I knew him from was Manchild. What is Manchild? It's a, a British show about four or five men who have kind of reached middle age. Most of them are divorced and kind of reinventing themselves That's right. in lots of awkward ways. <laughs> there's a there's an the, American version of this. The um superintendent from Death in Paradise is in it too. Yes. He's a, he's one yeah. of the other main characters. Yeah. But um so I knew him from that. So I was used to him being somewhat sleazy. Oh, okay. But you were used to him being a proper 
high school librarian who's into the occult, which is yep. a very different. It's um, a very different character, character to it kind speaks of jump in around. an actual British accent, yes. as opposed to this American. He pulls it off, though. I think he he does an okay American accent. He does. I'll and tell then, you one thing. Okay, so there's three tricks shown in this episode. Yes. Okay, the first trick is the Queen of Hearts fire arrow through the heart trick. Yes. And I love that trick because Jonathan does it in miniature. Mm -hmm. Then we see how it's done Mm -hmm. on the stage. And then we're told how it's done. And then we see the cabinet open and the prosthetic face. And one of the things I love about Jonathan Creek is it puts this stuff, the solution to the magic tricks in the background Mm -hmm. so that we, we have a sense of, Oh, I figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I saw that. That's how they do it. Because as Jonathan says in the restaurant, which I think is the central part of this episode, is that when you find out about magic, you realize how incredibly mundane it is. Mm-hmm. It, and it's kind of disappointing to find out how the trick is actually done. How the trick is actually done. Yeah. Right? So there's that trick. Then there is the mummy trick. Mm-hmm. So the Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden. Uh, Adam Klaus is dressed up as an Egyptian hypnotist pharaoh dude with an anubis head with an anubis head great costuming mm-hmm. and rhino and herbie wrap her incredibly i don't quickly. think it's them i think they're two different thugs i think it's two different thugs? yeah i think okay. they're different thugs okay. I, okay. on stage imagine having one of those adam claus t-shirts one of the original <laughs> yes adam claus t-shirts from he calls it his parody, passport from the parody yes. from the pilot oh my gosh those would be so cool to have. <laughs> So that trick is never revealed how they do it. No. Now. Except that when the sarcophagus is rotated 90 degrees, the bottom drops out and she slides down a slide. No, no. So that's that's the psycho. That's the third. Oh, that's right. That's right. The third trick is the psycho trick. We don't know how they swap places in the Iron Maiden. Which is also a cool magic thing. Mm -hmm. Now. How they actually do it is they, there's a cut there, right? Right. So, Just like there's a cut when they're supposedly wrapping her up like a mummy yes. that would take half an hour. <laughs> so then the third trick, which is the most problematic by far, is the psycho trick. Yes. In which a, a member supposedly picked at random from the audience. Gets naked gets on stage. Gets naked on And takes stage a shower. And comes down the chute. And that's that cute way of telling us how the trick is done again. Mm-hmm. Now, we're not, sh- we're not shown how the projection Shows up on the on the shower curtain. The shower curtain, but but I do like Adam's show. I think it's flamboyant and it's different than every other magician show I've seen. But also familiar enough to go, yeah. oh, okay, yeah, he's that yeah. kind of stage magician. He's a a David Copperfield kind of stage magician. I can only imagine that the writer Renwick must have done a ton of research to yeah. find out how those kinds of illusions are actually done. Now, you can buy a lot of those things. You can buy a lot of those things. There are illusion engineers online that I found who yep. sell like cabinets where you can cut somebody in yep. half and that kind of thing. But the equipment alone is not enough to pull it off. No, you have to be... The the Adam Klaus character is exactly that type of magician from the 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got beautiful assistants. And he's overly flamboyant. We're not going to say a David Copperfield name, but he's a David Copperfield. But his job is to distract you from what's actually going on. What's actually going on. I love how in the later episodes, he's insanely famous. Yes. (laughs) In this, it's kind of hinted at that he's slightly famous, like he has a driver and stuff like that. Well, he's sold out. A he, London theater for multiple nights in a row. Multiple, in the later episodes, he's crazy famous. He's like world famous. Yeah, he's like he is, world. He's like a David Blaine, David Copperfield level famous later. Let's just so, talk about the psycho trick for a second. Okay. Okay? <laughs> because it dates this show in such a fun way. Okay, you said something about Serena smoking all the time, and we've yeah. talked about double denim. But another marker of the fact that this is in the 90s, you know, prior to the Me Too movement and all kinds of other things, not not to mention that Maddie spends all of her time on the phone and not on the internet. You yes. Know? Um, and that there's no, it, Jonathan tries to call her from the payphone in the hallway at the theater yes. because there's no cell phone to do nope. it from. No, nope. pre cell phone. But he, so Adam sees Francesca in the audience and thinks that she's a hot tamale. So he wants to use her for the trick. So he calls her up on stage as the volunteer. But prior to that, when he's chosen her, he says to one of the stage managers, woman in black 
jacket, red top, black skirt. Can we do that? And she says, yes. And you think at the moment she's going to go out and tell her, come backstage after the show, Adam wants to meet you or something like that. He includes Jonathan in that. And you immediately think they're leches, but they're not. But that's not what they're doing. They're figuring out the trick. Yeah. So they're choosing an audience member and that stage manager is then going to grab wardrobe that looks a little bit like what she's wearing so that they can toss it over the shower curtain to make it look as if she's taking off her clothes. Yep. So they have something that appears to be a black jacket, something that appears to be a red shirt. Because when she goes down the chute, she has she, all those clothes yeah, on. Yeah, she's not taking anything off, of course. Yep. Um, but I thought that was kind of a little fun thing. Oh, I think it was super good. But the whole conceit of the trick is that somebody from the audience would be willing to go up and take off their clothes and take a shower on stage. I'm a pretty open-minded dude, but even behind a curtain... You You're wouldn't not, do it? No. You wouldn't take off your clothes on stage? Nope. With Sorry. somebody you don't know not and don't again. trust? No. <laughs> <laughs> not after what happened last not time. what happened last But time. it is a fun trick, though, that he yeah. dresses up as Mother Bates and pretends yep. to stab her. Yep. And that, that's kind of it's a fun, super fun. fun thing. The wife is in the frame. Mm-hmm. Okay? Everybody thinks it's the wife. The ex-jewel thief thinks it's the wife. The yeah. cops think it's the wife. But and, there's no way she, she could have done it. And Jonathan and Maddie start with the idea that she's the killer. So now we've got Maddie in the story. Yeah. Can we talk about Trevor for a second? Oh, Trevor. What videographer wears his Steadicam rig around his apartment? Uh, one who's soon to be dumped. <laughs> Those things are not comfortable, as we know later when Jonathan wears them. They're better now, but not that much better. They're still cantilevered, heavy camera equipment on an arm, basically tied to your body with like a backpack type rig that's really tight. I guarantee there was a film, people in the film crew that when Alan Davies had that rig on, uh-huh. We're like holding their breath. Yes. Because that's a $40,000 rig at that point. Really? Time. Oh, yeah. Hugely expensive at that point. Time. Yeah. So if he looks bumbling, it's he's pretending because they've clearly trained him on how, oh. how to maneuver around. But Trevor's just walking around the apartment wearing it. like Waiting like he's, on a phone call. Like he's ready to because film at any moment. Have more than one. Oh, my God. I, I know. <laughs> she's on the phone and he's like, you got to get off the phone. And what the crazy thing is, is this show goes from that yeah. to one of the characters getting in the show and being part of the show because she has a blog about magic. Yeah. That's all in the same time period. That's how quick things changed. Yeah. They changed a lot. Yeah. But I just, I love that Trevor's just hanging around with a steady camera. (laughs) They have a, I don't like, I like the actress. I don't like the character. You don't like Maddie very much. I don't like Maddie very much. I, there are things about her I like and things about her I don't like. She's not too bad in this episode. She's a very aggressive journalist who's yeah. kind of wily and doesn't doesn't have all the ethics she might have, but that's how you kind of get along when you're a freelancer. So I yeah. kind of get that part of her character. Later on, she acts a bit crude sometimes, and I I don't dig that, but um, not too much in, in this episode. I also think they overdo Jonathan's awkwardness. Yes. You know. And we see that with the she, sausage, because I didn't understand what was going on with the sausage. Oh, that he stabs her in the hand with yes. the... Yeah. Well, that's just an accident. But when she asks him out for lunch, he he says, he stops and says, do you want to have sex with me? Yeah. And he says, I'm no good with subtext when it comes to women. And it's like, yeah, but he is a professional, yeah. He knows how to have a conversation. Yeah. Just because she's a woman doesn't mean he doesn't know how to talk to her. It, it almost came read autistic the way he talked at first. Yeah. They definitely fix that later. Yes, and absolutely. even by the second episode, he's preoccupied and very logical, but he's not backward. No. But I do relate to his unwillingness to watch somebody eat raw onions. <laughs> Because I hate raw onions with a passion. <laughs> and to see somebody just crunch out like, oh. Ugh. Made me want Indian food. even though I. <laughs> what do you I, think of the trick he pulls at lunch? 
I think that's a perfect kind of trick to show how pedestrian magic really is. Yeah, that it's banal once you know. Yeah. But it's so brilliant yep. in the way he does it. Like, write down whatever she says. Yeah. Like, he doesn't even have to guess what she's going to say. Yeah. Which he could have done. He could have guessed, you know, New Delhi since yeah. they were in an Indian restaurant yeah. because it's very likely she yeah. would have, you know, said that. But it's even smarter than that. Yeah. So he needs. And then they use Photoshop. Oh! <laughs> There is a computer and there is a computer operator at the magazine and they use Photoshop. How do they do it when it's so damn pixelated? The photo resolution is like eight by eight pixels. (laughs) Okay. There is a long tradition of magazine and magazine design. Yes. Okay. And lots of different ways to to correct a photo. So interesting. And at the the apex of magazine, like when I was reading magazines in the 80s, that was the thing. Like Mm -hmm. I was buying 10 magazines a week to read magazines. People read so many. You do not understand how many more magazines people read. I used to go to a magazine shop. I had a pull list at a magazine shop. Oh, my gosh. Like... I subscribed to a few magazines. Yeah, people in high subscribed and, to me. Yeah. And then in the 90s, magazines just went nuts yeah. because of computers. Yeah. And you could then, lay them out faster. You could publish them faster. You could do all kinds of things with photos faster. And, and really and, interesting deconstructed design, like in Ray Gun and Interview and things like that. And wow, then they just super, died. Yeah. And then they just died. <laughs> but wait, so Serena says she's going to go to her office to work on the paste up. Yes. Right. Which is the mock up of the magazine with all of its layouts and yep. everything. It's every page of the magazine for that month's Which issue. You used to actually up. have to paste yep. up and put on. There were these walls of pages yeah. that, it, that and boards in newspapers and, and yeah. magazines used to do. But then they get a computer <laughs> and it's got Photoshop <laughs> on it and you can correct a zit <laughs> on somebody's face. So, 97, this would have to be Photoshop 1. It would have I, to be. I had that version. That Photoshop. And it only ran at Max, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, I had it only because it a, we had it in our yearbook uh, office on a Mac so we could use it. You weren't in high school in 97. No, in college. Yes, yes. In the yearbook newspaper office, which was right next to so the- So you were in college when this came out? In 97? Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to graduate. <sighs> This is when our age difference really sticks out. We're only six years apart, but that's a time in life when six years mat- wow. really matters, doesn't it? <laughs> like I had been working in the professional world in the suit and tie for four years by then. No, I was just graduating from my undergrad, getting ready to go to grad school. Wow. You're so old. Because of this, they get a scale model and do the funnest mock-up of the events yes. ever. I, we get to really see Jonathan's place. And I love how ordered he is. Yes. Because so th- you would need to be to do what he does. You've, you've got to keep plans and ideas and sketches. And everything I read um, from Illusion Engineers, all of them agreed that they were like consummate notebook people, that they keep sketches of all kinds of stuff, yep. ideas that they come back to later. And so he's got all of these like card catalog things in his in his uh, windmill in his home. So in the the wooden cabinet, the drawers that we see have audience involvement in illusions, memory, hidden objects, chains and ropes, escape from cutting knots and ties, playing cards, appearance in the audience. My favorite one though is tanks, water filled, person submerged. Yes, that's kind of specific for a whole drawer. Yes, uh, and then there's uh, a bunch of box files. They're mostly disappearing. Appearance, inanimate objects, animate objects, persons from cabinets, trunks, rooms, manifestation, manifestation. mesmerism. Yep. Of course, where we sit right now in our studio, I'm looking over at metal cabinets, filing cabinets, and card catalog cabinets that we have here. Let me list a few of the labels that are on our card catalogs specimens, mysteries, secret plans, plots, your mom. <laughs> Ghosts, X Files, Intrigue, The Truth, Mind Games, Kraken, Disguises. But I'm guessing his labels actually mean something. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're just dorks who put funny labels on drawers. 
I have to say, I think your mom is my favorite because it's right next to espionage and, and night walkers. The posters in his room are real and of real people, right? So They're very we, similar to the ones that we have in our dining room. Yes. Except I think they're authentic instead of posters. Uh, Surveyor's... Leroy is the first one. He's a Belgian illusionist who was born in 1865 and lived to 1953. Did the classical, a classic levitation illusion of Ashra and the Floating Princess. That's what he's most known for. It's all about branding, right? Then then he talks about Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. Mm -hmm. He barely mentions him. But Houdin, which Houdini is named from, is really the main guy, right? He took magic from what it was. Sleight of hand up close. Sleight of hand up close, lower classes Mm -hmm. to the theater. Right. right? It went from sideshows to theaters. Yep. And then the last one is a poster for uh, Masculine and uh, what is the other guy's? Devant, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Maskeline's a kind of interesting dude in that he is uh, a stage musician and he's also an inventor. Of course. I mean, if, if you're an engineer, if you build your own illusions, then that, that makes sense. Uh, he invented the pay toilet. Oh. Yeah. Like the concept of a pay toilet or yeah. like the coin machine? All I got is the inventor of the pay toilet. <laughs> so you can spend a penny thanks yeah. to him. Yes. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, His books, Sharps and Flats, The Complete Revelation of Secrets of Cheating at Games of Chance and Skill, is still considered a classic overview of card shark techniques. Is it shark or sharp? It's sharp. With a P. P or shark. Either they're interchangeable. Oh, so they're both right. But they're the same? They mean the same yeah. thing? And then in 1914, he founded the Occult Committee, a group of it investigates claims of supernatural power and exposed fraud, which I'm like, there's a comic book right there. What's his name? <laughs> his name is John Neville Maskeline. Nice. Yep. Interesting. Great, great name. <laughs> Inventor of the flushed, uh, the pay toilet. pay toilet. I wonder if he's involved in the prestige in any way. I don't know. Uh, David Devant uh, was an English magician. Most people see him as the English greatest magician and arguably the greatest magician of the 20th century. Did he invent the free toilet? No. Okay. No. (laughs) (laughs) I had to ask. I was born 102 years too late. Then. So it's the, the whole, the whole purpose of this scene. Well, there's a couple purposes. One is to get Maddie into his house so she can see how he lives. Yes. Right. And then two is we can't wait till the end of the episode for him to show off his skills. No. So we need an opportunity for him to do it midway through. So he makes the little dollhouse of Serena's office to demonstrate how she might have been able to get out of the office without being seen. But it's. It's, but it's an unlikely they thing. They do a to really happen. good job of starting believable and then going c- clearly unbelievable. Yeah. So you're, they, they, they flatter the intelligence of the viewer because when she does the little thing with the microphone, uh-huh. you're like, ah, she couldn't do that. No. And no. so then you're immediately like, they're wrong. And I know they're wrong, but they don't know they're wrong yet. Or at least it's possible, but not probable. Yes. And Jonathan knows that. Yes. But Maddie's like, wow. Yeah. And we're like, we're smarter than Maddie. Yes. I'm impressed they got the actress playing Serena to get down on the floor like that and climb around and pretend to be behind the couch. It was kind of weird. Because she like stop, drops, and rolls yes. back there. Because they do that that recreation scene mixes the puppets and and flashbacks that didn't happen. I think the the Smartest part of that is that when the doll for Joy is in front of the filing cabinet, we can see if she's looking for a B, she could see the door. Yep. And when she's looking for a Y, she can't. Yep. That kind of perspective that we get yep. through the dollhouse is the whole purpose of that scene 
you know, to, wh- to show us why what was actually possible. Models. Yeah. Which is why because he makes models. You make prototypes, you mock things up because it helps you solve problems. Jonathan's it pick- also shows us the lengths he's willing to go to to figure something out. Yeah, because he whipped it together in one night. <laughs> and creates things he doesn't have to, like stuff on the walls and stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, decorative yes. stuff that doesn't need to be there to illustrate his point. Because he already knows the answer by the time he's showing it to her. I understand that this has been in his family for five generations, and that is a valid line. The discussion of the parents of a 31-year-old man, I don't think need to be here. Yeah, he's all grown up and everything. Who cares where his parents are? Except to say, well, they immigrated and left it to me. Yeah. Okay. They're at PAU. There's no PAU. No, no. Unless they're talking about Punjab Agricultural University. (laughs) It's not in Philadelphia, that's for sure. That's for darn sure. Um, But his dad is an epidemiologist, so it's clear that he comes from smart people. Yes. And they care about him. He's got to be an only child. Yes. Right? So he's used to people, like, over-monitoring him, I guess. Yeah. You know? Um, But he likes to be by himself. So we realize that this is not what happened. So there has to be something else happen. Yeah. So we need to go to the house and discuss stoke vomit. <laughs> <laughs> stoke vomit. But this is where Maddie's skills come in because she's the one who gets them in places because yep. she's audacious. Yep. She is shameless. She's like shoving doors open, inviting herself in places. Oh, I need to use your bathroom. You know, oh, we're here for an interview that doesn't exist. She's unafraid of getting caught, being confronted. That's totally us at and, that point. And see, I'm totally with him. I'm like, oh, this makes me completely uncomfortable. Like, oh, we're not supposed to be here. Why are you nosing around? Stop looking at that stuff. We're going to get caught. And she's like, ah, whatever. What's the whatever. worst that could happen? <laughs> see, that, that, and that's you. <laughs> yeah, they're they're out on the other side of the wall, like in the cold. Like, oh, poor Jonathan. He just needs to be inside. So the napkin thing happens. The weird blood on the carpet thing happens. The face vacuum happens. The face vacuum happens. That must have hurt. Mr. Topless is not very nice. That must have hurt him. Well, not if they turned the strength of the vacuum down. Still would. It does leave his face looking a little bit red, which I think it would. Yes. And uh, they find Katrina in the gallery and they talk to her about that. And there is a Francis Bacon reference. Where? When? She goes, uh, Who does? He looks like I didn't want somebody to look like an early Francis Bacon. Who says that? I think Topless says it. What? Yeah. You lost me completely. Okay. They're in the gallery. In the house or the art gallery? The art gallery. Okay. And she says she didn't know about Francesca. Mm -hmm. And she says something like, I didn't want to end up like an early Francis Bacon. She's saying she's making a reference to the modern Irish born British artist, Francis Bacon, whose early figurative artwork is frightening. Oh, okay. (laughs) Should we encourage people to look it up or not if they've never seen it? Uh, it, It's not. Okay. It's frightening abstract. Okay. Rejecting various classifications of his work, Bacon said he strove to render the brutality of fact. Oh, so it's aggressive. (laughs) Yes. But his early work, he later went on to do like more religious stuff like crucifixions and popes and things Mm -hmm. like that. But his early, you're you're like, I know that's a face. (laughs) But the things are in the wrong spots. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So she's saying if he used me, somebody who's not beautiful as a model, his yeah. work might not have been beautiful. Or and she kind of that I think she's saying herself. that Francesca would make her look like that. Oh, in comparison. And that is the first instance of Francesca maybe being a little nutsy bobo. Okay. Because later on we get added on the Nazi Bobo-ness of, Fran- gotcha. of Francesca. Okay. Wow, that went right over my head. I missed that completely. Probably because I'm still reeling from how awkward that dinner is with Adam and Francesca. Oh, Why doesn't Jonathan just leave? I, I don't would just know. leave. I would just leave. Don't go in the basement. Don't go in the basement. Yeah. That's not how you keep a painting. It is if you don't care about it. I suppose, but if you love him so much, wouldn't you care about that painting? Uh, But she's not sane, honey. Imagine practicing shooting by shooting yourself in the face. I guess. There's something wrong. And another elastic is found. Okay, so then we also get 
the sort of subplot that the wife understands that they're not who they say they are. Yeah, because she wants to buy Francesca's story, she says, but she's got Maddie's book there with her photo on it. And I thought they were working together at this point. This again, going back to the earlier part of the show where I remember the setup and never remember the final. <laughs> So at this point, you think Serena and Francesca are in on it together? Yes. Oh, okay. That they were that they were both after Headley. Yes. Okay. But they weren't. No. I think my impression is that Serena and Headley were once very much in love. They understand each other that they're not their relationship has changed. Um, but though she might care for him a little bit, she's not blind to his faults. Yeah. And she's also very much all about Eve. Yes. And Francesca. <laughs> Her magazine. Yes. <laughs> and Francesca is loony mm -hmm. and topless loves him. Yes. Like, I think she actually. Katrina. Loved him. Yes. actually loved Headley. And yeah. I think he really cared about her too. He loved her too. Um, even though she wore the double denim, the vest, the shirt, the wow, oh, just bad. Why do you need that sleeveless top over your t-shirt? You don't need that. What do you think of Maddie's clothes? Frumpy. Yeah? Yeah, boring. See, I don't think I have a good measure of her clothes because I was so young in that time that th those would not have been things I would have worn. So I don't have a measuring stick for whether she's stylish or not. I'll tell you one thing. The cops aren't going to wait outside until a reporter and an illusion smith or whatever they're called. Illusion engineer. Illusion engineer. Uh, tell everybody about the crime. But but that's the conceit of every one of these shows, is that the amateurs get to confront the cr criminals until they admit what they've done, and then the police come in yes. and say, and I, it was your foot toe prints on the gun. I love how Adam Klaus comes in at the end with no idea what's and going like, on. Uh, I got champagne. Uh, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I think it was clever that they took her scales yeah. to get her toe prints. Yes. <laughs> and... I always thought it was weird that Francesca slips her shoes back on before she's found. And it's just to hide that she was barefoot, I guess. Yeah, I think so. But it's so weird that she's in a shirt, bra, panties, and shoes. Yeah. When they find her. Yeah. Maybe I would she think she was in the state of getting dressed. I would think putting the shoes on would have been the last is thing more maybe. awkward than not having the shoes. It almost points to her feet as being, yeah. oh, when she's clipping her toenails, I just want to go, will you stop it? <laughs> Yuck! The clipping goes flying in front of Maddie's face like... Yep. Ugh. Yeah, she's... It, it's that typical, I'm a beautiful woman except for at home where I'm, like, gross. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty on the outside but not on the inside. Yeah. Well, she's crazy. Well, she is insane, so... Yeah, she kills him because he isn't attracted to her. Yes. Though I do love the line when she tells Maddie... As soon as it, I, I got undressed, I could tell he was attracted to me. Yes. And Maddie's like, really? Really? Huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Naked supermodel. Hmm. Okay. A, I like that Headley actually liked to... Cr 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 uh, I like that Headley actually liked Katrina better. Yeah, I do too. That makes me like him more. Yeah. Too bad he's dead. Yep. Poor Katrina. Because her husband. Woo! Yeah. He vacuums people's faces. Yeah. Though I don't know why Jonathan had his arm around her anyway. I don't know. Awkward. Napkin. Oh, uh, I'm not going to think about that. Okay. So let me ask you a question about this whole setup. Why doesn't Francesca shoot Headley, then tie herself up? I don't know. Okay. There's no real reason that she... Well, other than the fact that she shot him when the... She could only think that... She was going to shoot him when the maid came in. So she must have known about the maid. Mm. So she waited for the maid to come in, and then she shot him. And that was a way of hurting him and her at the same time? The, there needs to be another half hour to explain some of the timing here. Yeah, the, the time between when Serena leaves and when Katrina gets there. Yeah. It's supposed to be a couple of hours. It is difficult to do these flashback things. Yeah. This is their first go. It's 97. Yeah. You know. Okay. Again, the, the mystery plot illusion twist figure it out thing gets a lot better. And this is just when television is beginning to get serious again. Mm -hmm. Right. We have Twin Peaks. We have X-Files. We, we begin to see shows of value in that late 90s period. Mm-hmm. 
that are more filmic and better written and better written and better editing and we're still at the beginning of that i can only think that she shoots them after she ties herself up because she knows the shots are going to bring attention that's and she may yeah. not have time to duct tape her own hands and stuff yeah. where does she put the empty roll of duct tape i don't know that it doesn't get found I don't know maybe her purse maybe but the like i have to think that if she's found in the room even if she's tied up mm -hmm. the cops go through her bag yeah Oh, they fingerprint her for elimination. Yeah. Maybe she but they just, needed to footprint her. Maybe she throws it under the bed or something. Maybe. Yeah. At the end, we get yet another awkward, <sighs> will they, won't they? And at this point, you just don't care. Yeah. It's too I, early it's too to early. want Maddie and Jonathan to care about each other in any yeah. way. So, and I like them far better as friends. Than I do lovers. too. I do too. I think they work better. But... She leaves the hotel room. He goes back to the bed or whatever to turn it down and watch TV or whatever. And then Watch Mr. Bean. And then there's a knock on the door. Is it the coffee or is it her coming back? I think it's the coffee, but we're supposed to not know. Yeah, but but you're you're saying it's the coffee? Yeah. I think so, too. Because it's too early. Yeah, for them to hook up. Yeah. It wouldn't work. Though, she's really good at bad relationships. She is fantastic at bad relationships. Maddie is like a serial bad relationship person. Yeah. And he's too awkward to even have bad relationships. So that's the first Jonathan Creek, the pilot. Yes. The wrestler's tomb. We only have one corpse. Yep. That's he Headley. Definitely. And after the credits, we're not even going to talk about because we have after the credits because we have another episode. The only only other people in this episode are Katrina and Serena. Yeah. Shale and Topless. There's a duo for you. <laughs> you know, and I think Serena feels a bit, ah, uh, now I don't know now that I'm saying this. I don't know if she feels better thinking that Headley was having an affair with Katrina or worse. Because if it was Francesca, she's obviously, a, yeah. you know, a, a girl toy. A throwaway. A throwaway. But if he's having an affair with Katrina, it was probably more meaningful and that might be more hurtful. Yeah. But it also means that he wasn't just after people who were physically perfect, yeah. which she's not anymore. So I don't know. I, I don't, don't know, know if she feels better. Or for she, she appears to feel worse when she finds out that it was Katrina he was having the affair with. Yeah. It's harder for her to take, which makes me feel bad for Serena. But I think she'll be okay. I think she'll be okay. Because she gets to live in that awesome house and run Eve. Yes. The next episode. That we're going to do is season one, episode three, The Reconstituted Corpse. And that will drop November 21st. This episode drops the 14th of November. Then November 28th, we will have season one, episode four, No Trace of Tracy. You can watch episode two if you want to. It's yep. all right. We're just not going to do an episode on it. We're just it. not going to do an episode. It's not that it's a bad episode. Go ahead and watch it. Yep. Yeah. Then the if 5th of December, it. we're going to do Poirot's Christmas, mm. which is just... A fantastic piece of cinema. Yes. It's one of my favorite parts. The farty sound. He goes to Wales to get <laughs> jab. The Christmas singing. There's so much There's greatness just so there. so much goodness. <laughs> then we're going to take a week off because I got to do a comic book convention. Go, let's go sell some comic books. And then on the 19th of December. Listener's Christmas Choice. Yes. And the Christmas song episode the big reveal of this year's christmas parody song best be getting to work on that <laughs> we're, we're already working on it we're working on it we haven't recorded it yet but i've been working on it uh, and then we're going to take two weeks off over christmas 26th and the uh, second we're taking off yeah yeah taking some time off we need a break good god and man we, the end of the year is coming fast we got we got uh, i hate to tell you this but i have plan two days to plan for 2023 already you said the other day there's only six more sundays until christmas and i'm like shut your mouth <laughs> <laughs> don't you talk to me about that i don't even want to hear it never mind that my kids turn 21 in 10 days yep ah! <laughs> nine days <laughs> ah! you know that scene in, in indiana jones in the um uh in in the the arc movie where the Nazis face just melts. That's how I feel thinking about them turning 21. <laughs> His just melty screamy face. Ah! Brave new world for us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woo, hold on to your bippies. Who knows what's gonna happen? Thank God they don't drive. <laughs> 
<sighs> I, I'm not on the don't drive team. <laughs> I'm just going to go cuddle with the dog and look at the snow. <laughs> All right, uh, don't try to thumb any butts, folks. Okay, we'll maniacs. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I have Stop something. the podcast. This <laughs> is something we have to add to the end. Yes. Speaking of what, <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> this is the day after we recorded the podcast because that's how important this is. Last night we were sitting on the couch watching the hockey game and all of a sudden I slapped my forehead and went, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot to mention the thing. This better be good, by the way. Oh, it's good. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's okay. good. Okay. okay. It's good. So so we're recording now the next day, so you can tack this on to the end yes. because we can't not mention this. Okay. Ah! Um, so I didn't have a horrible movie this nope. week. No for, horrible movie. For a reason. Okay. I had a horrible movie. Okay. But I couldn't verify that the actor from the episode is actually in it. Okay. So I need our listeners to help us. Okay. Because one of them may have seen this super horrible movie okay I that hope. i couldn't even find screenshots from wow okay so this is a movie that alan davies is supposedly in okay from 1987 wow are Not you known as a movie star uh, in 87 um he was born in 66 so he would have been 21 31. 21. 66 to 87. Oh, 87. I thought you said 97. No, no, no. 87. Yes, he's 21. Is, now, it, is this a movie we can talk about? Yeah. Are <laughs> okay. you ready for the title? Okay. Hit me. Golden Ninja Invasion. Golden Ninja Invasion. <laughs> yes. If I had one of those charts, you know, that you have as a little kid where you have to match people up with like another category, like players on which team. Uh -huh. And I had Alan Davies left and Golden Ninja Invasion. Invasion. You would say there's something wrong with I would with say this. there's something wrong with this quiz. I messed, I messed it up somewhere yes, because surely it's not him. No. Uh, the Golden Ninja in question is a blonde Scandinavian Kung Fu fighter. Of course. He, she is. He is. He is. I don't know what character Alan Davies supposedly plays in this movie. Okay. But it is on his IMDb credits as his first credit. Is this a student film? It doesn't look like it. It looks like the first of a series. Oh, my God. A very low-budget kung fu movies. In, made in England. I a don't place know. known for kung fu movies, I don't know. Especially about Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he's like Karate Kid, the original. Oh, you know? okay. But... That is all I know. Oh I looked God. and looked wow. and looked. Wow. Does he have a name or anything for his character? Or anything? It, n there's so little information. Oh, my gosh. I must now find this movie. So we had the Sister Boniface conspiracy. Yes. And now we have the Alan Davies mystery. Yes. Was he actually in Golden Ninja it, Is there invasion? a human out there who has seen Golden Ninja Warrior? Invasion. Golden Ninja Invasion. Remember, because so, it's like golden yeah. and ninjas and yeah. then like space invaders is invasion. It, is it multiple ninjas or just one? I think it's just the one golden haired ninja who's invading. How do you pluralize invading. ninja? Is ninjas? It nin is ninja a group of ninjas or? I don't know. Now don't, that you say that. Hmm. Anyway. Wow, we're nerds. You can see why I was like. We have to record this bit because yes. I can't believe I forgot to mention Golden Ninja yes. Invasion. So if you've seen this film, please <laughs> let us know. Or if you're able to find, like, maybe your library has a copy of it on DVD Some, or VHS or please, something. Please, I I'm guessing he movie. played a small part if he's yeah. in it, like an extra maybe? I don't know. I looked at every screenshot I could find. I looked up the name of the movie plus his name to see if he ever mentioned it in an interview anywhere. My Google foo was not good enough to find any evidence oh one way or gosh. the other. So please it, help us. It's a challenge to you, dear listener. Find out for us. See if you can find any evidence one way or the other. If Alan Davies was in fact in a movie in 1987 called Golden Ninja Invasion. Okay, That's for all. real this time. That's all. Bye, Maniacs. Bye, Maniacs. We're both anal retentive in different ways. And that's the episode. Are you ready?